Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you, not at all live, from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Thanks, Sean. This is Troy reporting from Los Angeles. I'm at Strategicon Labor Day weekend here in California. Here at the convention, some intrepid Flames of War players are engaged in a 24-hour long tournament. I'll catch up with tourney organizer Kevin Morris and some of the players. In addition, I'll talk with the events coordinator for Strategicon, as well as Harmon Ward, convention organizer for the upcoming Mini Wars convention here in Southern California. I'll also talk with several independent game designers and find out what they are releasing soon. I'm Mike James. I run the I'm the event coordinator for the convention, and I also uh, run the miniatures department. Jijicon is a thrice a year gaming convention here in, at the uh, LAX. How did Strategicon get its start? There were three other cons that came together. Actually, the original one, the first one was OrtCon, which is our February convention, started in Orange County at I want to say CSU or uh, Cal State Fullerton. And it was a bunch of war gamers that started there, and then as it got larger, it migrated around. A couple years later, it was popular enough that they added Gateway, and then eventually added a third one, which is GameX, which is the one for Memorial Day. So you've got uh, three different holiday weekends that are basically four days of gaming? Yeah, it's four days. every. It's all the long weekends. It's President's Day, Memorial Day, and Labor Day. And all four convention, three conventions are... They start Friday at noon, and it's nonstop until Monday at 6 if you want. And how many games roughly get run, say, just here in the minis hall? This convention, uh, we're at 130 events just for miniatures. The overall convention is in the 840 range, I think. And that's fairly standard. They, the conventions themselves vary a small bit in size by about 10% of the attendance. Uh, GameX is the smallest one. I think we only had 780 events at the last one. Okay, and how many people come through the door? Uh, anywhere from 2,200 to, we're hoping to break 2,500 at this convention, but Orcon and Gateway have been in the 2,400 range for a while. This particular convention, you guys have a, a new type of tournament going on. 24 hours of Flames of War. What did you think when you first heard that? I loved it. The concept was told me when it was pitched to me. It was the longest day. I go, oh, I like the kind the concept. What is it? Oh, it's eight flames of war games in a row, twenty four hours straight. And I go, that's madness. How many tables do you need? And I love it. I think it's fantastic. And the fact that it actually we have sixteen players in it now, and it came in a little larger than we were expecting, is fantastic. I'm glad to see the flames community come out and and support this crazy endeavor. I really want to come in here about 2 in the morning and see where everybody's at because these last couple games will be punchy and fun, I'm thinking. So it ends tomorrow, I think, about 10 a.m. And do you think we'll see the same number of players finish as we had start? Uh, You know what? I really would hope so because that would be amazing and fun. But in reality, we're all old. So, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were still like probably 12. And I think the best thing they have going for them is here at the hotel, they've got a bistro that's open 24 hours that does serve Starbucks. So if all 16 want to power through it, caffeine fueled, that would make it even more entertaining. Cool. How can uh, people find more information on Strategicon website? Uh, yeah, the website is strategicon.net and it has information about all three conventions, uh, how you participate whether you want to come as a as a uh, attendee or if you actually want to run games there's links to all the departments on there if you want to be a gm or a volunteer you know we have all kinds of jobs where you don't have to actually run a game you just work at a headquarters and help out a little bit earn a badge or just come and basically play for four days and i'm standing right outside the uh flames of war 24 hour longest day tournament with tourney organizer kevin so, Kevin, tell us a little bit about how this event came about. What what crazy person came up with this idea? Well, it was a uh, collaboration between myself and Justin Rodriguez, another crazy local here. Uh, we were at the convention last year, 
and sitting around at like one or two in the morning wondering when this hall closed. I found out that it doesn't ever close over the entire Labor Day weekend and the seed was planted for what we thought would be a fun Flames of War event, a little bit different. Try to see the darker side of Flames maybe at like three or four in the morning and... (laughs) So yeah, we just said what would you know what would it take to get 24 hours of Flames of War in? You know, three rounds is fun, four rounds is okay, but why not do eight rounds in 24 hours? And that's kind of how the longest day was born. So it's eight rounds right in a row with a little break in between. Right. So we've got uh, 30 minutes of break in between each round, but there is a one-hour dinner that we will allow the players to take. You know, unfortunately, some people like eating, I guess. Uh, Gamers like to eat, newsflash. So what do you expect to happen somewhere tonight about 3 or 4 a.m.? Are we actually going to see how many, the same number of players we got now? Uh, I think uh, we've got about 10 or 12 people out of everyone that think they can make it the length and go the distance. You know, they're going for speed, but uh, we'll see if they can make it. You know, I, I think the, the important thing is we've kind of really clarified as a, as a you know, group players here that we're here to have fun and we're going to try to keep the rules arguments to a minimum and just, you know, make sure that we agree upon whatever the TO says. So I think we'll have a good time and uh, there won't be uh, too many shenanigans. But uh, we did have a metal detector. Everybody came through clean. Uh, so we should be fine on that front as well. What about the the awards here? Are we going to have the normal podium plus more? Yeah, Justin uh, came up with the Rip Van Winkle Award for the first player to fall asleep. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see. We've got a couple guys that are you know not drinking coffee here, and we think that might punish them around 2 or 3 in the morning. Uh, on the flip side of that, we have a few people enjoying some adult refreshments. So it'll be interesting to see if they can actually keep going because I don't think for Loco is uh, manufactured anymore. So we'll see. Thanks, Kevin. I'll check back in later with you guys and see how you're going throughout the day. Well, I'm in Brett Hennies, and I am the co-founder and co-owner of Fantasy Adventures 360. Our game, The Realms of Mindrin Wars, is a it's a card game, our elevator pitch, I would call it, the card game War and Exploding Kittens Meeting in Middle-Earth. The general overall goal is to eliminate your opponent's character cards and you become victorious and in the process you collect loot cards for every bout that you win and those cards can be used to purchase an in-game game called the auction house which allows you to purchase and place bids on a card it can help either help you or hinder your opponent. I mean that's the overall gist of it. We have what they call buggy cards in there that can also do the same for anything from stealing your loot deck to switching your a defense deck with a one of your opponents so the idea is that it, it starts out as a little bit more chance in the beginning and strategy unfolds as you go as you start to realize who has what and as you purchase your cards in the game then you can start building your strategy if you need a little more strategy off the bat you can draft all your decks and if you need to you know you want a little more control over your your defense your attack and your character cards so that's basically the gist of this game, and it is a story. So there is a, uh, a series of graphic novels that we will release in the future that all tie into the characters in the game. And as I'm looking at the booth here, you've got basically one box of cards that uh, someone would buy? We have the main base game in the auction house, which came out in May, but we are now going to be selling them as one unit, and the next version of the game will actually include the auction house and a couple new cards that we're going to be adding in the next version and along with the whole new artwork which I as I tell everyone I did I did the first deck or the first game so this is the the beta edition and we're limiting it to the last 350 copies I I did all the artwork in this game like I tell everyone I I love to draw but I am nowhere near an artist so so what you get is this last or this current uh, version of the game is basically my artwork the creator the creator deck now do you have a new version coming out soon we're we're debating on uh what's going to be next in line Uh, we do want to do the next final version with our artwork from michael mccomb who will actually be here today but we also have another game it's a 60 card deck game that we might produce 
next, which will fund the next version of the Realms of Mindern Wars. So we're we're kind of in a in a business meeting per se between me and a couple other people about how we want to take that next step. But yes, there is a a, a a new version coming out. I'm hoping the end of 2020 or somewhere in the beginning of 2021. So where did the idea for this uh, game come from? <laughs> we had another project all together and my business partner up and had a heart attack two weeks before we were supposed to start it. So while I was at home, it was a June morning, 2015. My daughter and my son were watching these grown adults on YouTube opening these mystery packages of Shopkins and absolutely going crazy. And I said, I think I can come up with something, I don't want to say better, but comparable. And those things became these mythical weapons made out of polymer clay and sketches that I had done, which in turn became game pieces. I said, well, this could be a game. That eventually became a storyline. And then we had this whole elaborate board game, uh, which was our basically our flagship game and a four-hour type raid game. And, you know, your beer and pizza type, you know, we're in for four hours and at, at, at Steve's house tonight. And some friends of mine at Disney Animation said, you know, we love your game, but we want to play it at work and we don't have four hours. Can you come up with something faster or something else? And I saw on coffee, I had a coffee uh, someone Sunday morning and I came up with this game. And everyone's like, well, this is an easy enough, easy enough game to produce. Let's do this one now. And this is where it just took off. So that is now been our main focus is the Realms of Mindern Wars. And we'll eventually get back to that raid board game because everyone wants to get back to it. But we have 20 games that we're producing, and that's including the expansion and, and the current version of this game. So those two are already kind of done. So where can people find your games online? Um, currently, we are on Etsy. Etsy.com shop Fantasy Adventures 360. And if you're in the L.A. area, somewhere out and about, actually, I guess that would be, I don't know what county that is, but we also are carried by Epic Toys out in Rancho Cucamonga. How much development time goes into actually designing a game like the uh, Realm of Mindran Wars? It depends on how much free time you have. <laughs> we, um, we all have other jobs, you know, of course, so it takes us longer to do. But I, I, we pretty much started this back in 2015. And we're, what, 2019 now, so we have gone through many renditions. We've beta tested at game shops, at conventions. Uh, we do a lot with the, the Geek Girl Society up in Newhall. They, they've been wonderful at beta testing everything for us, and they give us straight-up feedback on the game. So, I mean, it's been, you know, a good couple of years to do this. We've gone from the first version being on black-and-white cards to multiple printed versions going through the Game Crafters website and then finally getting our last batch done at Print Ninja. And they were, they've were they been great as far as printing for us. And so, I mean, it's to kind of itemize it as all the work we've done, I'd say about two years, but that two years has been spread out over four years with life and work and kids and we're in a gaming renaissance right now where we see a lot of new games coming out, especially from independent producers like you. Are you noticing any trends that seem to be popular in the gaming space right now? Well, I mean, because I'm fantasy-based, I see a lot more fantasy-based stuff. And I think a lot of that stems from a lot of the computer games like World of Warcraft, where people like that genre i mean you see it in movies and books and games and i think a lot of that stems from people missing that social interaction they love their world of warcraft they talk to their guildies they they talk to their friends you know on chat but half the time people can't remember what they talked about the next day but they they want that social interaction so it's kind of taking that genre and meeting at somebody's house where now everyone can sit down face to face and interact. So I think a lot of that is coming back. And like I said, I see a lot of the fantasy stuff. <clears throat> I see a fair share of the sci-fi stuff too, but I, maybe I'm just more attuned to the, the fantasy stuff. Um, even looking around here, the first thing I see other than our banner is a huge knight wielding a sword out <laughs> of dragon. So, I mean, that's, you know, and then, of course, another one over there, too, that uh, seems to be the same genre. So 
to me, you know, maybe like I said, I'm more attuned to the fantasy versus all the other genres. But, you know, that and adventure seem to be and sci-fi seem to be, you know, the big ones. Well, you mentioned you've got about 20 different games you're producing. Is there something you want to tease that isn't quite public yet? <laughs> hmm. Let me think about that one. Um. Yes. Next question. <laughs> Let's just say it's a 60-card game, and it has a little something to do with dogs and cats, and that's all I can give you. That's enough for our uh, listeners now, but uh, thank you, Brett. It's been good talking to you, and um, one last time, the name of your game and what it is, you know, the 30-second elevator pitch. It is The Realms of Mindrin Wars, and the elevator pitch is War, the old card game War. Mixed with exploding kittens meeting in Middle Earth. Sounds good. Thanks, Brett. We are in the 20th hour of the longest day. We've had about 19 players, and uh, so far we have 12 people left, which uh, to me was a pretty high percentage. I thought a lot more people would have some common sense, but I guess us Angelinos are a little thick skulled. If someone actually falls asleep at the table, what do you do? Well, that's the uh, the classic move that they have to call the TO over. And uh, you'll call their name out three times. If they, a sleeping player does not wake up and make a Flames of War move, uh, the game is called in favor of the wake player uh, and immediately scored. Okay, how many players are actually still kind of coherent and making intelligent moves? I think we've all made some pretty uh, silly mistakes, even for our level of player. Uh, we, I think some of us might have been backing our tanks backwards, uh, trying to cross woods repeatedly. Uh, I think all of our skills have, have dropped down uh, a significant amount. So this is almost like playing uh, drunk with a hangover while driving. Right, yeah, pretty much. I would uh, agree with that assessment. Um, and I'm pretty sure most of these guys probably don't want to see a pair of dice for the next uh, probably four weeks or so. Has anyone claimed the Rip Van Winkle Award yet? No, we came close. Uh, a couple of the guys that were kind of nodding off, uh, I would say about 16 or so hours in, called it. So they, uh, they just threw up their hands and, and went to bed. Uh, we've had a couple guys in this last uh, 19th, 20th hour uh, come close. I saw some closed eyes. I got ready to blow the whistle, but, uh, you know, they got off the mat and they continued their games. So uh, props to them. Excellent. How many more hours left? How many more rounds? Uh, I think we have about three and a half hours left. One more round. Um, so the, the leaders are definitely established uh, over the seven games that we've played. And, uh, you know, us guys in the, uh, in the rear are, are just trying to make up and hopefully at least beat a, uh, a three game total score that's our that's our goal thanks we'll check back with you in a bit going all around for 24 hours and i'm gonna be like a joker <laughs> Uh, my name is Bradford Obi, and this is David Panzer. Yes, I am David Panzer. <laughs> and uh, the name of the company is Moonlit More Games. And what game are we looking at here at Strategicon? This is The Last Days of Athabry. It's a game about uh, five civilizations that could never go along, and because of that, their world is now dying. So as you play the game, the pieces of the planet fall off, so you have less and less places to go, less places to get resources. The object of the game is to gather your resources to build your ship and get off the planet. Whoever gets off the planet first wins. This looks like a board game with more stuff on it. So talk a little bit about, um, since we're audio here, not visual, what do the players see when they sit down to play this game? So when they're playing Athabray, there's going to be six different land types. So oceans, marshes, forests, and that's what those colors that you can't see represent. And there's colors that match the resources that players are out there fighting for. Um, we set it up as hex tiles. This was Brad's brilliant game mechanic 
because we've got a deck of location cards. And as you play, you draw those, and there's two for every hex tile. So the first time it will flip over and maybe burp out some, some resources that you couldn't ordinarily get there, and then the second time it disappears. So one of the things I like is that there's a speed up process. So every time you do one of those hex tiles, you also flip a world event card, and the world can smack you around a little bit. So you always have to have like a plan B in your back pocket because you never know what the world's gonna throw at you. So within that world event deck, though, there's a stacked deck, sort of like Pandemic-ish, where it actually will speed up. So you start out by flipping two every time, then three, four, five. So things become more and more desperate. But I love that it's kind of a slow burn. So the different civilizations can build up their technologies, and there's things that will help them search, things that will help them fight each other, things that can maybe help sabotage other people's equipment. Um, but you sort of get your mechanic going, you figure out where you're going to go with it, and then once things speed up, you better make your spaceship. <laughs> How many players uh, makes a good game, and what's the min-max for number of players? So min-max is uh, two uh, to five, but four, I think, is the sweet spot. So I always like to play a game of four players. Um, it keeps things interesting. How long does a normal game take? Uh, roughly two and a half to three hours. And where are you guys in the stage of development with this? Um, well, we're ready. We just need to get money. <laughs> <laughs> our, you can see our, well, you can't see, but our prototype is pretty much a finished product. Um, uh, there's some pieces that we're going to upgrade a little bit, but for the most part, it's, it's a finished product, and we just need to raise the money to publish the, the game. So where can they go online to kind of see what the game is and decide if they want to um, invest in some sample product or, you know, get, get in on the pre-orders? The website is www.moonlitmore.com. That's M-O-O-N-L-I-T-M-O-O-R dot C-O-M. And then Atherbray, if you go into the games, there's like a game menu. You can click on Atherbray. It'll tell you more about the, the game there now is this the uh, the only game you guys have that is this close to production uh yes we have our 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 deck builder that is very close but still needs some play testing uh but it's a uh, memory it's a memory deck builder where you actually use the game of memory to build your deck theme so what i love about it is that you've got a ship that you're that you start with and each ship has like a piece on the front that looks like a nice solid ship and on the back it's falling apart so you attack each other while you're playing this deck builder with your cards and sinking a ship is a game condition but it's still all about the booty so he with the most gold wins <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Thank you much. Uh, again, uh, the website is www.moonlitmore.com. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks so much. That I want to play this for a while. Okay. Kevin, we're done with our game. I'm here at the uh, Longest Day Tourney at Strategicon and interviewing one of the players. Uh, tell me your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Justin Rodriguez and I'm from Solvang, California and I'm very tired. <laughs> and uh, what army are you playing in the tourney? I brought an American list and it had two formations. It was a very brittle list designed to be uh, w played with quick games and um, it was a tank destroyer formation and a Stuart formation, sort of min-maxed. And uh, how many games have you guys played so far? I had one buy on the second round because we had a lot of players at the beginning. Um, we have played seven games to this point, if I'm not mistaken. And um, there are still several of us standing, which is very impressive. I. Um, I'm ready for the final round. Hopefully, I'm feeling the most tired right now at the final round. I got a second wind at, uh, I don't know, 3 in the morning, and I was doing jumping jacks, acting like a complete buffoon. Um, but it was, I guess, live entertainment for the rest of the players. What, uh, what is the beverage of choice for the players so far? I think it's been a lot of coffee. Coffee. Um, earlier in the day, there was some brewskis consumed. But it was an uh, even pace. I know I didn't drink. It was a strategy of mine not to drink any alcoholic beverages because 
I did not want to fall asleep. I come to this convention pretty regularly, at least twice a year. It's hosted three times a year, and um, I'll make two of the conventions. And sometimes if you, if you drink, I fall asleep maybe one in the morning, two in the morning. So you haven't fallen asleep yet during this tourney? Not at all. I'm still awake. We've walked around a little bit, um, and uh, we're still going strong. Any idea where you're standing in the uh, results so far? Well, because I designed my list to be pretty brittle, and I wanted to play quick games because my strategy initially was to uh, play quick games, try and get some cat naps in between the games, but I wound up staying awake the entire time, and mostly um, it's kind of to help Kevin out because Kevin is just blowing me away with his uh, stamina and fortitude throughout this whole event. He's been very tired, but he's been doing an awesome job running the event and keeping track of scores and everything. Uh, it's pretty amazing, actually. And uh, the, the, the fact that this many people stayed awake the whole time. Right now, we're going into round eight, and no one has yet to win the Rip Van Winkle Award. So the Rip Van Winkle Award is the first person to fall asleep at the table. Um, have other mistakes been made that are making people scratch their heads or uh, cry out in victory when their opponent does something stupid? Um, possibly. Uh, I think people have made some uh, sleepy blunders, but surprisingly few. I don't think a lot of people have made too many mistakes. Everyone's pretty focused, very tired. But when the games c turn on, I mean, the adrenaline starts pumping, and these guys are going. I'm looking at uh, two games right now, it looks like, possibly. Maybe some chit-chatting or one game. I see Christian and Eric going right now, and they're both awake. But in between the rounds, sometimes people finish the games really early, and we have like an hour break, and that's when people start nodding off. But they somehow have managed to pull through, and we're going into the home stretch here. I gave you a couple no dice, no glory dice. Have you used them in your games yet? Those things are cursed. I did not use them. <laughs> But I know a certain friend of mine, Malcolm, has been using them. And uh, Igor called him a cheater because uh, when he needed them to roll low, they rolled low. And then they were rolling no dice, no glory sixes. It looks, it looked pretty frequently. <laughs> Any words of wisdom for anybody who wants to come back and do this with you guys next year? Uh, we had a good turnout. And I think the fact that this is such a bonkers tournament... Uh, hopefully it gets some attention from some of the big groups, you know, back east and uh, maybe Able Company. We can cajole those guys to come out here or some other Flames Orb groups. Hopefully maybe closer to home like the Bay Area or San Diego guys. But uh, it's pretty fun. I think we'll need to make sure we get more tables because we had 12 tables originally, initially. And we kind of scrambled to get a couple more tables because we had more players show up than we anticipated, which is quite surprising. Uh, this is probably the biggest Flames Over tournament that's been hosted at, uh, you know what you think? Yeah, it's been one of the bigger. Um, um, anyway, yeah, we had a lot of people show up, so I'm optimistic. If a lot of people promote it and they say they liked it, we'll hopefully get more people and we'll do it in September next year because once a year is enough. I wanted to say um, earlier, I wanted to say thanks to Brian at the Game Ogre. He did provide prize support for us, and uh, Battlefront came through with some awesome official plaques for the 2019 tournament series. What they think about this tournament in the future, I'm really tired, so I'm long-winded rambling. I'll uh, give it back to you, Troy. <laughs> thanks, Justin. Good luck in the tournament. Um, I was on the objective, he was bailed, and I bailed the second one. Malcolm After lost on his to turn, Igor. <laughs> so you lost with, I the, lo with the cheater dice. With the cheater dice. <laughs> the <laughs> cheater no dice failed me when it was most important. The no dice, no glory cheater dice failed. I'm Paul Schminicki from Wolf Lord Games, game developer in South Orange County. Basically, this is our first game that we launched in Kickstarter, successfully funded last year. And we're here at the show selling some special bundle packs, kind of like bundling up the different card games and different miniatures that we created. Okay, I see a uh, sign that says Dragon Lords. Tell me about that. It's a, it's a dice and deck game where basically it has a mechanic of a basic kind of Warhammer light where you kind of roll dice to attack and you roll dice to defend. And there's three zones and you basically have 55 points to create your unique deck of good and neutral and evil and neutral cards. There's unique races, there's unique upgrade cards. So on the 
certain knights and the certain characters, you can add good weaponry, armor, and so forth. But those have point values, so that takes less, you can have less infantry and less archers because you're adding power of upgrades. Each side has a dragon and a dragon knight. You only can have one. It plays one to four players. We have solo play, one versus three, and two versus two. So when, when a person gets into the game, what are they looking at cost-wise and what are they getting for that? So you get 250 cards with one deck of 30 uh, for $30. And basically you can play one to four players. You have everything there. The only thing is with that $30 smaller deck, you basically can only play good versus evil. What we're trying to sell here today is a bundle of two decks because that gives you good versus good, evil versus evil, and so you don't have to fight with your brother or sister over certain characters. You can have the same evil character or the same Dragon Knight if you like that certain character. We have a website also that calculates everything for you. You can look at each card, analyze it, build your good deck and evil deck, and it calculates all the points for you, all your spell points everything and it kind of teaches you along how to get your deck and you can print that out so you can go to a tournament with like an evil deck good deck or a neutral deck already set up for you just to pull the cards and be ready to go and play okay tell me a little bit about game setting when they're looking at the world that this game's in what's it like basically the dragon lords run and kind of rule these certain territories so they're kind of like the kind of the nuclear bomb of these certain armies so they protect their 10 different kingdoms with these individual dragon knights. And they basically, the more powerful the actual land is, it's the more eggs and the more squadrons of dragons they have. Okay, so we're basically dragon army versus dragon army. Yeah. They're intelligent creatures, so these dragons do control other units with spells and verbal. How long did it take you to actually design this type of a game? It's probably taking over a year to create all the design and all the artwork. If you look at the art, we're from South Orange County. We've been doing video game development for a long time, working for Sony PlayStation and Microsoft, doing add-ons, artwork, animation, and modeling. So if you look at our, our art, it's pretty like high-level, pro-level artists that work on each card. Each one is linen finished. The miniatures that we have, we create in ZBrush. So the miniatures are really highly detailed. Packaging is every really top notch. Okay, so your uh, your game company not affiliated with Sony itself, but you've you've Contract, done the work. Yeah, done work. We're contracted by Sony and uh, Microsoft for the Xbox. And then this is like a, a family company that the family company we started. Basically, we've been working in game design and art for a long time. So we decided to create a new division, a new department of just to get into the board game market. We've been playing board games. A lot of our designers play games in tournaments, our tournament level players. So they always wanted to do this. So we said, okay, let's jump in. Let's create an actual game that we can create as a uh, hard game. And then we're going to follow up probably in about a year and a half time with a whole digital game on, on Steam and PC. Oh, cool. Yeah. The, um, the demo game you've got set up over here in the booth that I'm looking at, and I'll, I'll post a picture with the, uh, the podcast. Uh, it looks like you've got mouse mats, not boards. What's what's going on with that? How does that work? Yeah, basically there's um, three zones. So the card units that basically uh, your elf units or your orcs or whatever, they can actually move and fly into the different zones. So you start with your home world, which have you have a home world card that you have to select that gives you bonuses to defend your home. But you can move out of that into the middle battle zone and then or go all to the enemy side in the enemy zone and attack them there too. Okay, so uh, if somebody wants to get your game and find the deck builder, etc., online, where do they go? What's your website? How do they get in touch with you? Wolflordgames.com and basically go to the Kickstarter page and follow along and you can buy it on Backer Kit for a limited time. We'll also, we'll be rolling out, not yet, but soon on Spotify, Amazon, and we're gonna find a distributor to be at your local stores too. He's contesting, so I just got to bail that other guy. So who's the runner? That's the runner. And I'm back at uh, Strategicon at the Longest Day Tourney. 
interviewing one of the participants. Who are you and where are you from? Uh, my name is Eric Kamba and I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. And what kind of army are you playing? I'm running a Soviet Hero Rifle Company or formation. How have you been doing in the tourney so far? Uh, I was going back and forth. I think right now I am three and four. So my last two games haven't been too well. And uh, what has been your um, least favorite opponent here at the tourney? Least favorite as in like how bad I've been beaten? <laughs> Well, which which army, not the player, but which army seems to be the, the bane of your army? Okay, yeah, the army is definitely the uh, the Italian. I played an Italian army. It's uh, the L6 army. Those are hard for me to handle. I don't have a lot of anti-tank in my in my army. So, yeah, those, those are the most difficult, the difficult armies to, uh, to deal with. And talking off air earlier, you had mentioned that you were pretty used to uh, working third shift overnight stuff. How's that helping you or hurting you today? It's actually it's actually helping a lot. I started to get my second wind about three and two three in the morning, so I think I got well. I don't have a choice. I've been <laughs> I've been here all this time now. I got I got three hours left. I've been here 21 hours, so I figure I could finish in the last three hours. So when you get done, the awards are handed out. What's your plan afterward? To pack everything up as soon as I can, head to the airport and fly back home. Uh, and that wonderful 15-minute flight between L.A. and... Uh... That's going to be the most wonderful nap I've had in the last two days. <laughs> Uh, any advice for anybody doing this uh, next year if um, the Los Angeles players decide to do it again? Uh, advice? <laughs> uh, get lots of sleep the night before. Lots of sleep. You're going to need it. What about the uh, beverage of choice to get through the, uh, the tourney? Surprisingly, I was mostly water. I had, I think, one tea, half a coffee. and But, yeah, mostly stay hydrated. If, you know, stay hydrated and lots of water help. I don't do the energy drinks. I don't do the five hour energy, nothing like that. A little bit of caffeine, some sugar and don't don't. I don't eat a lot. Just kind of snack throughout the day. The more you eat, the more you want to nap. Good advice for everybody. So um, any any last words of encouragement? Are you coming back next year if they do this again? Uh, if they do the 24 hours, I don't know. I, I definitely have to see how I feel when I get home later today. Today, yeah. look at that. Not even tomorrow, today. Good luck in the tourney. Uh, hope you guys do well. And uh, thanks for talking to us. Uh, thank you. you got it this time. Both players roll die. Okay, attacker picks a long table edge to attack from. Both players with a starting attacker face two objectives from the eight centimeters of the opponent's table edge. I'm really hungry. It's kind of like free for all. Yeah, yeah. yeah except with delayed reserves. Yeah. Yeah. We're rolling off that vineyard. Uh, objective goes <laughs> I'm Harmon Ward. I am the Historical Miniature Gaming Society Convention Chairman. And I'm here at Strategicon running games, playing games with my sons and grandsons, and getting ready for my convention in uh, the end of this month. And a lot of the game masters from the HMGS PSW are here as well running games or playing in games. What what types of games does the organization actually support with their membership here at the uh, Strategicon? Well, from the name of the organization, we tend to focus on historical games and uh, a lot of historical research, getting the tabletop looking accurate, making sure the map represents reality. But all of this have been in gaming for a really long time. And for example, my background in gaming come, came from Dungeons & Dragons. I started with Dungeons & Dragons in 1974. And eventually, I wanted an army to run big battles for my Dungeons & Dragons group. And so I gravitated into the historical gaming. Like I said, the focus is, is historical, but we do a lot of everything. Now, at this convention, for example, I ran Battletech uh, Alpha Strike, and on Friday night, I ran Lord of the Rings, the game's workshop, Middle Earth strategy game, because I have grandsons, and they like that stuff. So I brought out what they like to play. I, there was also Rob Boyens, who was doing a great Gettysburg game. 
We had a number of different uh, historical games from the San Fernando Valley Gamers. Uh, they're here today doing another one. Let's see, what else did we have? Oh, uh, Cruel Seas. Alan Rockwell had an incredible Cruel Seas table from Warlord Games with all kinds of mosquito boats and e-boats and a harbor with a uh, incredible lighthouse. And it just very photographic. If you ever come out to a miniature gaming convention, bring your camera. I noticed that we've got a lot of young gamers at this convention. Coming up at Mini Wars at the end of September out here, why don't you tell us a little bit about that convention and uh, what younger players might want to come out and connect with in that realm? I'm glad you brought that subject up because obviously it's very near and dear to my heart. When I was a child growing up in Garden Grove, every father on the block had served in World War II. Everybody's grandfather had served in World War I. And Vietnam now is a lot older than World War I was when I was a kid. And so military history uh, is not something that's thought of or taught as much as it used to be. And at many wars, you're going to see a huge number of people that have a passion for history and for the accuracy of it. When we paint miniatures, we don't just throw on color. We try to get the colors the way they were. And since colors fade, there's often a lot of science involved in the research, trying to figure out what they were. And we look up the flags, we look up the movement of the troops, and we cover the origins of the conflicts and the results of the conflicts. At our last convention, we had a professor who talked about the Crusades and the interaction between all of the different actors in the Crusades. And then we had a game that showed a sample conflict between the Saracens and the Crusaders, and all of, the, all of that action and that three-dimensional touching of the miniature and the preparation of putting it on the table helps you focus on what you're showing. And what you're trying to show is a slice of history, and you're trying to put yourself in that place. It's not an easy task, but it's one well worth taking up. Okay, so as a 13, 14 year old young man or young woman who's got a little bit of interest in history, they get their parents to bring them out to a gaming convention like the uh, the Mini Wars put on by HMJS PSW. They walk in, they're going to see big tables full of big battles, and it can be a little overwhelming. What else is there that they might? gravitate to from the beginning that's a little more bite-sized and not big and overwhelming? There's a number of different titles that would come to mind. In the Ancients realm, there's a game that's still played quite often called DBA or Debella Antiquitas. And it's very small armies, very small groups of troops, maybe 30, 30 or 40 per side. In the more modern era, Warlord Games has a game called Bolt Action, which is squad-based, small numbers of troops. And you can build a big army, you can build hundreds, but in order to get started, you only need about 30 or 40. And take it from me, the former president, all of us would love to see 13, 14, 15-year-olds with partially painted armies and an enthusiasm for play rather than someone who steps back and say, I'll never get that done. I, I would tell them, don't be intimidated by what you see that people have put together over 20 years. Look at what you would like to do over the next two or three months and actually come up with a plan to get it done. We'll show you, not just our organization, but there's lots of hobby organizations with people that would love to teach other people how to do what we do. Mini Wars is at Cal State Fullerton on State College Boulevard in Fullerton. It's at the end of the month. 
September 28th and September 29th. It's a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, the admission price is $25 for non-members, $20 for members. There's a daily admission, which is $15 for non-members and $10 for members. Parking is free. Uh, it's in the Titan Student Union. Very, very nice facility. Very high ceilings, uh, very well lighted and... I can't say enough about the facility. It's a great place to have a convention. We're going to have dozens and dozens and dozens of historical games with a smattering of science fiction and fantasy. We're going to have vendors that sell games and game supplies. Uh, we're going to have a flea market where people get, uh, get a chance to sell what is surplus to them and somebody else may find to be a treasure. There'll be lots of tournaments and competitions and a painting competition. It's been a lot of fun. It's a growing event. Like I said, the focus is history, but we say anything miniature, anything historical. And one guy said, can I bring out my board game that features trains? And I said, are, are trains found in history? And he goes, well, yeah, there you go. Come on in. Where can people find out more about the organization and uh, the convention itself? Well, as you expect, we have a website. It's hmgspsw.org. And uh, you go there, and there'll be links to how to sign up to run a game. There'll be a flyer with a lot more information. That will have the list of the games that we'll be running. At 9 o'clock in the morning, the history lectures start. And this year, they kick off with one by... Major General John Harrell, retired, who is going to talk about his new book on the Soviet cavalry in World War II. So uh, Soviets had a huge group of men that fought on horseback or from horseback against the German invaders. And uh, he did an extensive amount of research, and, and this is his second book on history. There'll be more lectures after that. That starts 9 o'clock on Saturday. The history lectures are free. If you want to come in just for the history lectures, they start at 9 o'clock. The parking is free. You can come in and then just walk around the convention a little bit. You don't have to buy a ticket to look. And you guys are on Facebook as well, correct? We are on Facebook, yes. Uh, HMGS PSW. Excellent. They'll find you there. Thanks, Harmon. Good talking to you. Thank you, Troy. We appreciate it. All winners. Yeah, for, Thanks, for not dying. We had a couple of close calls. Eric Campbell almost had a heart attack at one point, but he survives. You're a survivor. So, uh, the, the contabulations have been contabulated, and mathematicians have all been paid. So, uh, without further ado, Igor in first place. Yeah, buddy. Black, and then pick any one item. Number in second place in the last minute by a Stephen Error, Christian J. Sorensen, second place. Third place was Malcolm. Before we give out the rest of the prizes, because everybody's going to get a prize, everybody's going to get a mug, don't worry about that. We did have a couple other awards. Uh, so best sportsman, it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, unanimous almost. Eric Camba. I guess uh, because you were so sleepy, it was hard for you to say oh, rude oh, things to your opponents. Go ahead, grab something, grab your thing. And then uh, the Rip Van Winkle. Uh, I think we all survived. None of us fell asleep during our games. However, there was one person at this entire event who was able to get some serious shut eye. While we're all screaming at the top of our lungs, Mauricio, yeah. you got the Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> well, well earned. Well earned. Uh, all right, so number four was Tyler. Yay. Yay. Go get a prize. Next. Tyler. Tyler. Pick, pick any of the 